Thank you. Um, so my name is Garrett Smith. Um, I, uh, I'm an architect at CloudMeets, and uh, we make uh, fairly extensive use of Erlang, and this is a, uh, uh, something that came out of both my experience there, uh, as well as uh, experiences teaching Erlang at Erlang Camp. Um, before we get into that, though, I want to just quickly, so for, for the record, thank Basha for that like wild shoot dig last night. That was fantastic. Um, I've been to events like that, but it's usually not associated with open source technology, so it's like really, really, really awesome. And uh, I had a, a fantastic time. Um, at, that, at that event, there was uh, a gentleman from Joint, and he had, it was a particular point in time, he you know, asked everyone to be quiet and gave Basho um, well deserved accolades. And, uh, and he said, uh, as sort of prelude to this, he said, uh, there are, are developers out there who like to solve easy problems. And I said, woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> That's me. And just like you laughed, there were people. People around me laughing, and I, and I thought, I actually, I'm very serious. I actually like to solve easy problems. I, I hate hard problems. Hard problems are awful. Um, easy problems are good. So then he went on to you know, further elaborate. And the developers who really have the, the vision for solving hard problems, like Basho, uh, um, those are the special developers. And uh, and I felt a little bad because uh, I absolutely don't like hard problems, and I'm, I'm not a special developer. I'm sort of one of those those other developers. So felt a little bit bad, and, but it was an open bar, and that you know, kind of helped things. <laughs> um, so the evening proceeded, and uh, and uh, I think things closed up uh, around uh, eleven thirty, and I was felt a little too early. So of course we went out to another bar and, and continued that. And, and all along, I'm thinking in the back of my head, you know, I actually have a really big problem to solve. Um, and uh, the background of that problem is uh, is my hotel room, uh, my hotel. So when I booked for this event. I decided to use Hotwire. Hotwire is this sort of you know, gamble a little bit. Uh, you pick a region and you pick sort of a rating, and uh, you get the hotel that they pick for you, and you prepay for it. So, um, so I, it's kind of fun. I, I like it. I've used it before, and uh, so I, I picked the region, and I got a hotel that was three blocks from the venue. I'm like this is awesome. Uh, it worked out perfectly. So I got a really nice, nice room, good price, three blocks from the venue. It's fantastic. So I get here on Wednesday, and I'm walking from the park. And with my suitcase, and, and, and here is a three block stretch. <laughs> so, so, in the middle of an urban center, they put a mountain. And on the side of the mountain, they put my three blocks. So, I'm going up this, this hill, and uh, I fully appreciate how damn steep this hill is. And as you're drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking, I'm, think, I'm thinking to myself, this is really going to be a very hard problem for me. Uh, of course, one of the you know, milestones of drinking too much is you are challenged with walking. Um, there's a technique that I use when I get to that point, and it's very physical, it's a very basic form of walking. You just lean forward, and your instinct will catch you as you walk. It's called, it's called stumble walking, and I, I've used it effectively. Um, you can walk miles uh, stumble walking, but you can't do that going up the hill. I knew that last night, and I thought, this is going to be a hard problem. So I get to the, this stretch. And uh, I'm just like, you know what? I like easy solutions, easy problems. I'm just going to get a cab. And he's going to drive me to the top of this hill, and that's going to be it. But then the gentleman who joined his words rolling in my head. And you know what? I'm an early developer. I'm one of those guys who likes hard problems. I'm going to solve this problem. So I looked up the hill, and I said, this is an insurmountable problem. This problem is too hard for me. I simply am not going to walk up this hill. It's impossible. It's too abstract. I, I need an elevator or something. So, Let's try to make this easy. I'm going to break this into three segments. Three blocks. Each one is progressively steeper. True. It's horrifying. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to take this problem and break it into three. I'm not going to worry about the third one. That's the steepest one. It's the most horrifying one. I'm just going to take the first one in front of me, which is somewhat reasonable. It's still, though, it's still a bit of an abstraction for me to get here to the end of that block in my current state. Too much of a problem. So I took that problem and reduced it to a more fundamental problem, which was, look, I'm just going to start to walk. I'm just going to focus on walking. You think, may, may think I'm kidding. This is literally what I was thinking last night. This is how I get up to the hill to sleep and not collapse in the gutter. It's important. So I started to step, and I said, this is going to, I'm going to have to be really conservative. I'm not going to, take, I'm not going to go fast. I'm going to go really slow. I'm going to conserve my energy. Uh, because I, I need to, I, this, is just, this is my process. This is my simple line of sight problem solving. And uh, I got to the next stage. And that big problem became slightly less painful. 
the same thing. I got up, and this is a slightly steeper stretch. So I'm starting to, like my cardiac issues are starting to happen. And uh, I get up to the top of that, and a couple of people who were just as inebriated as I was, probably more so, a couple of young women came up, and I stopped, and they genuinely asked if I was doing okay. I said, what, are you okay? I said, I'm fine, I'm an Erlang developer, I'm breaking this problem down, I'm almost there. This is not that big of a problem, because now I just have one third left. I'm gonna make this, I'm going to do this. And he said, you know, we believe you. We believe that you're gonna do that. I was encouraged by that. So this is the stretch, this is really steep. You should, I mean, I'm not, this does not do it justice. It's like crazy, it's like a ski slope. We finally get to the top, and I find that just like, and here is my view. I accomplished this impossible problem. I went from impossible to the possible by simply reducing, thank you, thank you, simply taking the hard problem and reducing it to a series of small problems that you can execute, that are line of sight that you can actually execute. Simple problems, hard problems. And you might, you might ask, or might argue, you know, this is sort of a hopelessly naive approach to problem solving. How can you take um, you know, impossible, difficult to define abstract problems and simply reduce them to these primitives and expect to really get anything of great complexity. Um, you don't see that in enterprise architecture, you don't see that in enterprise software architecture. It's generally very high level um, abstract solutions. It's never you know, building incrementally, very rarely building incrementally. But then again, I look, I look at this type of thing and you see one of the most magnificent and breathtaking architectures uh, that you'll ever see in a single cell organism. And at no point did this organism ever have the single huge problem to solve. It only had trivial, simple, line of sight, stumble, drunk, blah, blah, types of problems. Gravity taking forward, taking you forward, and you're in your, your instincts, your reflexes catching you along the way. Line of sight, trivial problems can indeed manifest as fantastic solutions. So that brings me to why I heart Erlang so very much. I heart it, I heart it a lot. I'm a fanboy, I'm almost a fanatic, if you will. And it bothers me because I don't like to be a fanatic, but about anything, really. But I really like Erlang a lot, and I like it because it, it helps underscore, it helps make easy this process of taking complex problems and boiling them down into simple things that's very easy to see in your code, in your architecture, in your design, where it is too complicated, you're trying to solve too many big problems. And it gives you a, 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 some nice tools and patterns and axioms or little components uh, to, to, to do this type of drunk walk, stumble, walk up the hill, and you finally got it, oh my god, I got up the hill. So I heart Erlang, and I want others to heart Erlang. I think you guys probably all heart it very well, but I want more people to heart it because I think that this sort of is a DAO of problem solving and software that we just don't see in, we just don't see it and it's tragic. Uh, we don't see experimentation at a very low level uh, to prove things. We don't see um, gradual iteration. We don't see a, a, a discipline of reducing problems so that they are completely trivial and obvious to solve. But in Erlang, I think you see that a lot and I'd like more people to enjoy that benefit. It's important. So there are some problems with Erlang. It's not a hideous syntax. I think that you can get through the chamber without turning into stone that's been hyped a little bit too much. Um, but if you look at some of the core uh, components of, of Erlang, in particular sort of the OTP architecture, there's a lot of moving parts there. And my experience uh, in working with people to help them learn OTP and Erlang, how to use it, one of the big stumbling blocks is, okay, I finally kind of sort of get my head around all of these new concepts. But I'm not sure how to, how to put them together. Um, and I think that that is a, uh, uh, it's a problem that we can solve. It's a, definitely a problem. It's a barrier that doesn't need to be there. And I would like to work to try to remove that barrier, reduce it, so that more people can heart Erlang. So that brings me to E2. E2 goals, as I just stated, was really to help the people use Erlang. It's not to circumvent or go around or create something new. It's simply to enable people to use what is already there. One of the easy, low-hanging fruits, one of those line of sight problems that is just totally brain <coughs> obvious, is let's get rid of some of the boilerplate. Let's remove some of the noise 
um, and you'll see what I'm talking about with boilerplate in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, let me just keep an eye on time here. Yeah. Um, just when is this done? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so boilerplate is easy to remove, so we'll go take care of that. Simplified APIs. If something can be made more simple, let's make it simple. Um, you'll see a counterpoint to that in a minute. Uh, and then just as important, okay, so 15, got it. Um, so uh, uh, just as important is to take the components and, and, and present them in a way that people can use to solve their application problems. Concepts like gen server, gen SM are, are certainly understandable, but then the question is how do I use it? How do I use this to build something? And that's not always an obvious uh, answer if you're, if you're new to, uh, to OTP. Okay, some non-goals. Um, I want to avoid any change for the sake of change. I want uh, this library to reflect our lang, not the library. So as people learn and understand through this particular library, they get closer to Erlang, there may be some changes, there may be some different spins on things, but really I want, I don't want to change uh, any more than, than, than need, need be. Um, and that undermining OTP is along that line. Um, I'm not of the opinion that the Erlang syntax is hideous. I think that people use it in a hideous way a lot of times, but there's nothing inherently wrong with the syntax of Erlang that needs to be changed. So we're not going to see parse transforms or other things that try to offload and, and, and address that problem because, in my opinion, it simply is not a problem. Uh, and then, just as a matter of principle, I think it's consistent with the Erlang uh, DAO, the design tradition, uh, to avoid magic. That is, avoid things that uh, are in the background or things that are potentially surprising. And Erlang is a fantastic uh, disciplined language in that, in that respect, so we want to keep that tradition. Okay, the status of, of, of E2, um, it's very usable today. I would call it feature complete. It's sort of in the phase where uh, the features are in place, it's very stable, there are going to be edge cases that may not meet your requirements. But we're running it at Cloudbees in production and uh, it, it's, it, there's been no issues at all. So I, I'm, I'm very happy with it in, in its current state. Uh, we'll talk about sort of next steps in a little bit, but I think today you can pick it up and make good use of it. Okay, so in, in, in E2, uh, I take the concept of the building process and break it into two process types, um, services and tasks. Uh, so a service is basically a gen server. Uh, it, you start it, it's a process, it waits for messages and it replies. Um, I use the term service uh, because gen server is a bit cryptic and services of contrast to task, and I'll show you that in a minute how tasks and services, why I use those terms. A task is something that starts and is expected to run. Uh, it may run right away, it may be deferred, it may repeat itself, uh, but it's something that when you start, it is expected to at some point run. So it's not going to necessarily wait, it typically wouldn't wait for something to trigger it, it would just go on its own, sort of somewhat actively. So, I'm very confident in this, and I'm confident in this approach in, in, in breaking things down between services and tasks because all the software in the world today runs on operating systems that have these two primitives. Uh, services uh, map to system demons. They run uh, at startup when, when the OS boots, uh, and they stay there and they do things. Um, and they run, uh, they respond to messages, uh, but they're expected to be there as services, as facilities. So an example of a, ser of a, a service or a daemon in an, an operating system uh, would be Apache. And of course we know that uh, Erlang is designed as an operating system for your code. So um, we can sit and write something like Apache and run it as a service, the system daemon. The other type of process that's run on computers, on operating systems, are these jobs. And uh, when you go and, and run a shell and you type a command and run something, you're, ex you're executing an ad hoc job. This is typically run through cron or a scheduler or something else. So the job starts up, it runs to completion, and you might repeat it, you might defer it. It's got a scheduling component, but it's one of those active things. And that's it. That's the way all the software is managed and run in, in the world. And I'm confident that we can do anything with these two primitives. And there's really no change. It's, they're both gen servers. They're just concepts that allow uh, a developer to start thinking about software construction. Gen server is a great utility, but it doesn't help to give you cues as to how to use something. By mapping these concepts into the realm of the operating system, I think we're going to give people a better chance at assembling the systems that they, they need to build in Erlang. Developing applications in Erlang is a matter of developing systems. It's the same process as going to operating systems. 
servers and installing Apache, MySQL, configuring them, right? The init sequence that you use when you start early mirrors the init sequence that occurs in the operating system. So I want that to come out. I think that is a hidden gem that needs to be talked about more. And using E2, people will be automatically put into this realm of services and tasks. Okay. Let's sit here. So let's take a look at some code comparisons. Um, here's a gen server. This is the boilerplate that comes from, I'm uh, sorry, the, this is a template that comes from uh, the Emacs, uh, well, whatever I have, the Emacs, Emacs mode, uh, early mode of Emacs. Um, I've simplified it a little bit. But you can see here, um, if you were a new user and just looking at this for the first time, uh, you might have a lot of questions. Um, you have to start to explain what this is, what this is, the different handles. These are message handling, um, terminate, no change, etc. There's a lot to sort of get people's head around before they even start to code. The corollary sort of minimal skeleton requirement of a service, which is the analog to a gen server, generically, is this. Most of the boilerplate is really that boilerplate. Most of sort of the distracting noise is kind of up in the exports and the, and the uh, there's, I've left the barrier on the, um, uh, the behavior declaration out. There's a couple exports that could be combined into one, et cetera. But if you look at the code, the code is very straightforward, I think. Um, you start it and then you handle the message. So in E2, the three functions, handle info, handle cast, and handle call are consolidated into one function called handle message. Um, and it's actually not that, it, 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 it works out quite well. Um, it's analogous to the message loop that you program when you first start to learn Erlang. It's one place to go put your handlers so you're not breaking them up based on the way that the message was sent. It should be a, hand, a handling logic independent of how the message was delivered. Um, so that's a very simple, I think, uh, way to say you have to handle messages. You start it, the process is running, processes receive messages, you handle the message. That's a service. And in fact, that mirrors any service that you've ever seen. It's something that starts up, it runs, and it handles the message. Services, by definition, are uh, software that runs behind some protocol, right? And that protocol provides a, a, a intermediary stage, and you basically respond, call, respond to calls from the outside world. So now we're seeing sort of very, very trivially architecture reflected in Erlang. So let me point out, this is a gen server. This is running pure gen server code. This is just a layer on top of gen server. You have additional function overheads to map um, the inbound gen server to this list layer. That's one function call. So you get a much cleaner, I think, abstraction uh, to work with at minimal performance cost. And particularly for new developers, I think this is valuable. Performance is not their main concern, especially the overhead of a single function call. Okay, so that's the service. Here's a service with init. The idea here is that we take a very basic skeleton and we can incrementally add to it. We don't have to get everything at once. So if you don't need an initialization sequence, and that is to say you don't need to uh, perform some init within the context of your, of your process, of the server process, you can just pass the state right here. So that comes up. That's a, there's not a lot of cases. There are cases where you're just passing, it might, it might be a port value, it might be something else and you just want to pass it through. There's no reason to have an init. But of course, we want to perform any non-trivial uh, function, fun init functionality in an init uh, callback because that's executed in the context of the process and that's good. It protects the caller from any crashes. So <clears throat> if he wants to. Uh, so we have here an init that you can incrementally add. So now it's starting to look a little bit more like a gen server. Okay, now we can also add terminate. If you're interested in handling terminate, you just add it. Um, the, uh, Trap exit is handled um, so that you get called. Um, it's a common problem uh, when you're, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out how to get that thing to get called. This just takes care of it. Um, and, uh, and you can actually override that trap exit if you want to, but uh, in most cases you want it because you want it called. Okay, so that was a service. I'm gonna start to shift over to, to tasks. Um, there's a, a very common pattern in Erlang, which is you, you know, you want to start something right away. A process that you want to start, it's like a you know, in thread, you have run, it runs right away. And when you're doing spawn, you have your loop. But in gen server, it starts and then you wait for messages. So if you want to run right away, you obviously can't do it in init because that's going to block the caller, the start, the start caller. Um, you, you use this trick, not many people know about it. You can send yourself a message up here in init, but the, 
the, the more thorough, correct way is to return zero. Not very intuitive. So what that will do is it's going to cause Gen server to send timeout before it handles or, or before it's not even a message dispatch. It's a direct call, but it's within. It's after the uh, caller has returned. So it allows you to do your work as soon as you can. Uh, this is, of, of course, ho a horrible interface. It's a hack. It's just simply a hack. Um, to try to explain this, I mean, I just explained it to, to you. Try to explain it to somebody who's just starting out with Erlang. And they're going to be like, this, is a, this language is, is not very nice. I don't like this language. <laughs> and I don't blame them. If they're just starting, right, that's the point. They might not have the tolerance to push through to get all the benefits, just to recognize that this isn't that bad. But when you're starting out, it feels really bad. So here, E2 task. So you start it, and then you override a single function called handle task. There's no you know, hackery. Um, you don't even have to respond to a message in this case, because no, there's no message to handle. You're just going to run. Of course, you can add handle message, because you might need to interact with the world outside of your, your run state. You can repeat here. You can delay things. We'll show you some examples of that. But when you say, hey, if you have a task that you need to run, it means it needs to do something, start, and, uh, and finish. Just use a task. Super simple. So here's a variant of a task that repeats every five seconds. And again, very, you know, in the spirit of kind of this incremental improvement, we start with no options here, and then we add them as we need to. So we're not asking the user to provide more than he or she needs to provide initially. So then we just say, when you start, I want to repeat every five seconds. And then down here, if in fact you want to repeat, you could stop if you wanted to. You could, you could uh, simply wait for messages. But if you want to repeat, which is the usual handle task again, you call this. Very simple. So what will happen here is it will wait five seconds. It won't wait five seconds. It'll make sure this is called back at the five, five second interval. So it's a little bit, it's not just a sleep. So here's a task start with initial delay. So you can say delay. You can also add a knit. I don't know if I have an example of the init. No, I don't. You could alternatively, if you needed to do your initialization um, and, and uh, had to get that value someplace, you could omit that option, implement your init, and then return the timings, the delay and repeat uh, in response uh, uh, to, to uh, along with your state. Um, so that, that use case is accommodated. Okay, supervisor. So this is this is also one that is just uh, complete. I mean, I don't think there's any controversy about the idea of taking this and, and, and helping people to understand what the hell is going on. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not going to spend a lot of time just trying to explain why that's not the best interface for somebody just starting out. All right, so this is the equivalent supervisor in, in, in E2. You simply have hello. Right. So what are we going to do? 99% of it. It's not startling. Probably you're probably doing something. So the default, of course, is start link. The default argument list, of course, is an empty list. Um, and there are some other decisions that are made, but those are defaults. They're sensible defaults. Those are all documented. And then you can override them. So if we want to override them with some options, let's say we want to make this temporary, but default is permanent, typically what you want. You start something up, you want to make sure it's running until you explicitly, uh, well, uh, argue. you could argue against that. But So that's debatable. The defaults are debatable. It happens to be permanent in this case. So if it wants to be temporary, you specify uh, a restart of temporary there as an option. Uh, here we're saying we want um, 100 uh, milliseconds for shutdown. The default for shutdown is brutal kill. Um, again, you can debate that. Uh, the the, the uh, argument that uh, has been made to me, and I, I tend to buy it, is shut, brutal kill is determinist. Uh, 1,000 milliseconds is not. You can have bubbling up effects, etc. cetera, um, uh, if you use these timings uh, not wisely. Um, so brutal kill is the safe, might not be the most pleasant, but it's the safest and, and probably the best defensible default. So therein lies uh, another value, which is we can sort of figure out for new users what the best defaults are, and they don't need to worry about them until they actually need to worry about them. So we can collaborate and say, what's the best default? What's the most sensible one? So maybe the ones that are there now need to be changed, but whatever they are, they should be there so people don't have to worry about them up front. More examples of, of, uh, of different arguments. Oh, so in this case here, we're saying I need to pass an argument. So you know, we're not. I'm not. The, the goal is not to take functionality away from Gen Server. If you can do it in Gen Server, you have to be able to do it in E2. If you can't, we'll change that. Um, 
the goal is to make it as easy to start as possible, but then everything thereafter is also possible. So supervisor of some different options. So you get, get the idea. Now, here's another sort of hidden, hidden issue with, um, with our lane, that is the behavioral difference between a simple one-for-one -one and the other, uh, the, the other strategies. Simple one-for-one -one is a very, very different beast. Um, and unfortunately, it's just reflected in this one little atom difference. Uh, you use a simple one-for-one -one when you, you want to basically fire and forget, when you want to auto-collect your children. So, you, you know, children stop and get automatically removed. The other um, strategies don't have that characteristic. Um, I felt that's too, that's too implicit. For me, when I discovered it, it was like a eureka moment. It shouldn't be a eureka moment. It should be something that's described up front. Um, it's a very common pattern to start children and forget about them. That's one of the best patterns you can possibly have. Like your whole application could do that. That'd be perfect. It'd be awesome. You don't want to keep track of things if you don't have to. So a task supervisor is a simple one-for-one -one that is designed, it, it just is, it's a simple one-for-one -one that it works with tasks. So it's just somewhat syntactic, not syntactic sugar, but it's sort of API convenience is to use the correct supervisor for tasks. And it's this easy. So you I'm missing, I'm missing a slide here. So the default here is remove this. Um, no, this is a mess. Uh, this slide is a mess. I don't know what, what was going on. I didn't do it last night in that state. It was before. I have no excuse. <laughs> I have no excuse. Um, something's wrong here. Uh, there are examples on the website, so I apologize for that. But the idea here is that you start it easily. You pass in the, the mod of the start spec for, uh, uh, for the child, and then you just call start task. <clears throat> so, the, so E2 has, so this is the, that, that's sort of the core, that's sort of the core um, of E2. And just, just to sort of summarize what's going on there, um, I want to be able to sit with somebody who's never used your lane. I don't care about teaching them the syntax that much. I don't care about atoms and you know, pick this up naturally. I want to talk about how they can solve those big problems, like going up that big steep hill. And I want to be able to say, hey, look, Here's an example of some random problem you have. Let's break things down and give them some primitives that are sort of totally obvious and straightforward that they can use to build their solution. And I, I, I haven't done this yet, but I think, I hope, if it's successful, if this experiment works, people will get excited because they can solve hard problems using very simple, direct line of sight solutions. And it's all our lane. This is just a way to help them to sort of use our lane more easily. So, in that same spirit, there are several other facilities that help common problems, and this is a starting point. This will probably evolve a little bit, but uh, what's there currently? Some log support. I, it bothers me to have to say error logger under, you know, colon info report. It just bothers me. You know, I've been in, in, in meetings when people are like, what, there's an error there? No, 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 no. It's, an, it's an error logger. Why is it an error? I'm, I'm logging an info message. Like, that just, to me, is like, I just can't get over that. So. Um, there's a log service, there's also a log to type in, and if you know it. So E2 log is just a nice short way, you can do info, you know, error, it's sort of a sensible API, I just think the error, error, it, now error report, it's using error report, error, error report, is that the module? Error logger, sorry. Um, it's using that, right, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to like, oh, say, well, I'm gonna improve early, I'm not that, I'm not that skilled. I can simplify it, because I'm kind of stupid, I'm like, if if, if I can understand this, then it's probably fine. But I'm not changing anything. I'm just sitting a layer on top of the stuff, so it's a little bit less onerous and difficult to, to get started with. Um, custom logging uh, is a little bit difficult, so if you want to plug a, lo a custom uh, a log handler in your lane, it's a little difficult. It's not terrible, but let's just try to make that easier. So this is an example of a, a syslog logger, and basically it's a behavior, and all you have to do is handle one event. Um, you have sort of the init. Uh, functionality that you would expect with uh, a gen server style API, uh, but you're handling one, one symbol and you're, you don't have all the other trappings. Um, and you do lose some functionality here because there's some data that, that, that's getting lost. But I think for most use cases, it's going to work. And if you don't, if this doesn't work, you can always go to the, uh, uh, the gen event facility uh, in, in uh, uh, AirLogger. So, another common issue is um, uh, validation. There's a terrific fail, you can fail fast. And, 
ignore uh, error uh, validating user input and everything will kind of work. But your, error, your users will get terrible messages, you know, things that are crashing with, you know, sort of unrelated uh, problems. Uh, it, it would be good if you could provide good validation in the client-facing functions, uh, uh, just a better and easier way to validate uh, property lists. You can see that property lists are used extensively in, in E2. Um, and I like to use them in general, so it's just a common pattern. You have your required, it's like, you know, when you uh, get out, right, the pattern where you pass your arguments uh, and then you have options, right? Your arguments are required and your options are these things that follow. So the same thing in API design, you, you can say, you know, function, absolute, drop dead, required, and then a list of options. It's a very, very, in, in a great deal of OTP, early, early OTP uses that today, a great deal does not. Uh, or uh, E2 as a full design principle uses it. So in that, uh, there's a facility, there's, a, there's an OT under opt, which will allow you to define a schema and say something like this. Um, uh, here's my schema, it's a name, uh, it, it, these are named property lists. So this is the uh, property strategy. The legal values in this case are listed, that are enumerated here. Um, there's this implicit, which if you omit something, um, if you, if you simply list one of these without having it uh, specified as a, as a uh, strategy, um, uh, it'll, it'll be applied uh, and you can provide a default. So there's different things you can have in all the functions. So it's a little scheme. It's not, it's not meant to be a big, it's just a little thing um, that allows you to do quick validation. Um, so if you use this, you simply take the schema, you say e 2 opt validate. Here's my list provided by the user, and here's the schema. If it works, you're going to get this structure back, which is opaque, odds. And then you can just read your values from that. So if the default values weren't provided, the values are missing, and the defaults are provided, you'll get the default values out. So this is a valid set of properties at this point. And if, there is no, if, if, the, if the input was invalid, you'll get an exception there uh, with some descriptor, you know, missing this, this is required, bad type, that sort of thing. So it's a nice little facility to help users do more validating up front of, of, their, of their messages. Without this, it's actually your code that gets very, very laden with validation logic, and it's, it's, it, gets, it gets hard. Okay, so the, uh, the plan, <coughs> the plan improvements aren't, there's not much here. My goal for this is to keep it small. Um, you know, I am a big sort of dependency fanatic in terms of not having dependencies. I hate having libraries if I don't need them. I'd much rather just write, you know, the little missing piece of functionality and use that. So, um, if this becomes a big framework, then it's 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 gone off the rails. It needs to be small and trivial. Yeah, people need to feel comfortable in putting this into their project uh, and not feel like they're bringing in, um, you know, some big heavy framework with a lot of uh, a lot of other dependencies. So there's no other dependencies on it, um, and it's small. I want to keep it that way. So there's not a lot, um, mostly in my, my sort of interest right now is to just help satisfy developer use cases. So tutorials, examples, like how do I build a, how do I embed, how do I do a web app? I mean, my, my current intro tutorial is how to build a database server. It's because I didn't want to do web app. Everyone does web apps. Database servers are one of those big, high, head, you know, hill climbing exercises that if you break it down into small steps, trivial solutions to obvious problems, it's actually not that bad, not that hard. And that tutorial illustrates that. So I need more things like that to help people solve particular problems. How do I monitor something? You know, it's a very common problem. It's a very good problem for Erlang uh, to tackle. How do I do this, that, the other? Um, so that's, that will get filled in. So ideally, you know, either you could go and, and, and learn something, but I'm assuming that people in this room are, are very comfortable with their, uh, the patterns of development that they use. But you may be working with people who uh, want to use Erlang and are interested in it. Um, and it's, you just know it's going to be hard for you to sort of transfer all that knowledge. If this is a, a facility, a tool set that will help you, please use that. And the more use cases and more examples and you know, the more we can refine the target user's experience, simplify that experience, I think we're going to get some more developers in this community. I think we're going to see more projects rolled out. That's, that's really what I'd like to see. Um, there's some missing functionality that uh, needs to be, but it's, but it's quite minor. Um, so here's the possible things. Um, it sort of implies what's not there. Um, there's some Gen Server 2, there's like four of them out there. I don't know if you've ever bumped into one of the infamous Gen Server 2s. 
Um, there are good reasons for these gen server twos. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they are, but I know that people use them. For, they're not irrational. But they, there are different ways to pull messages off the queue. Um, there may be some options that we can throw into our list to say, hey, pull, pull messages, messages off this way. So it's always you know, E2 service, and there's some, some behavioral change. And then maybe under the covers, there's a gen server two or some other you know, a gen server variant that's actually used. Um, but if that's an important, some, something that people can feel is important, we'll get that in there. Um, global registrations are not in there. Don't, I, I don't use distributed Erlang, and that's a sort of a personal philosophy. And I understand that is not at all going to ultimately fly. So I'm pretty sure global registration is going to have to land in this at some point. Because I don't use it, um, I don't want to just put it in and say, oh, it's in there. I'd like to work with somebody and, 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 and make sure that it really, really works well. So if, you know, if anyone's interested in collaborating and, and helping out on that front, I mean, it's, the door's wide open. <coughs> I also don't use JFSM. I know a lot of people do. It's a, a complete cornerstone of what they, what they work on. So that's almost certainly going to land somehow. I'm not sure. I, I, I just don't use it. I don't feel comfortable sol solving that problem because I don't understand it. So again, if you have that need, you know, just say, it'd be great if we could do this and then work together to try to make a really drop-dead, simple approach for somebody. Um, things like wardrobe rules, other kind of higher-level um, abstractions that are common but aren't available in, in OTP. Um, did I even talk about publisher? I don't think I did. I left it out. There's a pub sub publish subscribe facility in, in ET, which is um, an ability, a very common pattern to provide extensible functionality. So you have a, uh, a broker uh, who can receive messages and you write them in and he dispatches it out to, to handlers. So if you want in your application to make something extensible, um, you can do it and it's different from gen event. Uh, it's not a performance consideration, it's a, it's a security, uh, an isolation uh, consideration. So a broker, all the listeners are, they're not functions that are running in the same process as the, as the broker. They are separate, so if they crash, they can just be restarted and handled. So that's a facility that's in ET, and it's an example of something that probably ought to be someplace in the Erlang low-level ecosystem, because it's so common, such a common pattern, and it's easy to do in Erlang. So things like that, you know, worker pools might be another. Um, just uh, not to get, not to turn this into a big fancy framework again, but just little things, little point solutions. You know, Wolf's uh, GProc. I think it's got to land in here somehow. And so people can publish um, you know, statistics and information about their processes uh, without having to be pulled. Um, those are patterns that are really important. So that type of thing will probably land. Um, down the road, uh, I think 0MQ is a, is a really good fit for a line uh, in terms of actual like non-distributed motor line. So that's another thing that's out there. So that gives you an idea of sort of where we're at today and, and the thinking. Down the road. Okay, and then um, you know, if you want to start, it's uh, everything is, is on that website, so uh, uh, it's easy to go to that website and get everything you need. Um, so with that, I'm done, and I'll open up for questions. So, five minutes for questions. So, um, so how come you decided actually? Yeah, so the question is, why did I use OTP at, at all? And the idea of, of uh, I, I am so not qualified. So there's two things. Number one, I can't. I'm just not smart enough. I wouldn't be able to do it. Number two, this is extremely robust tested functionality. It's like the heart and soul of, of so many production systems that have been working for so long. And why wouldn't you want to use it? Um, these are features. Uh, you know, this the interface to these may be troublesome, but the function, the underlying delivery, the ability to operate is, is completely proven. So I want to celebrate and use that and just make it easier. It's not a good example. So for the gen server, I didn't see a, a behavior. So there's the E2, does it define a behavior? Yeah. Because then the task is, I was confused whether it was just an omission from the slide or whether that was a specific <laughs> choice to not yeah. make it a behavior. So I'm not sure how your, your question translates to the microphone, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll repeat it. So the question is, in some of the slides, I omitted a behavioral de declaration. So the behavior is just a compiler warning, um, and I, I use it to also signal things. It, it helps to you know, signal the intent and design of something. I did omit them from some of the slides, probably either from by mistake or to save space, but um, I think in the first example, I mi omitted it, uh, I'm not sure, it, it, it possibly to, to save space, but I probably just forgot. So 
So there is a behavior oh, yeah. of the task and, and all of, yeah, yeah, all of all of the E2 um, E2 task E2. Oh, they're all behaviors. So you, they're they're just an, an extension of the of whatever you know gen server really. Um, so you, you'll so in terms of what's a behavior, how do I use this? I mean, it's the same experience. You just have less to implement. You have less to deal with up front than different interfaces for starting and configuring things. Do we have any other questions? All right, thanks. Thanks a lot.